We are so blessed to be able to welcome back to the pulpit today a wonderful, wonderful, uh, not only preacher of the gospel, he's the son of uh, our church that has been existing here uh, over at least 40 or so years under various different titles and configurations. He is my uh, younger big brother, amen, uh, and uh, so glad to have uh, the opportunity to serve in ministry with him. Uh, he serves as the state director for the Pico California uh, uh, network that is really about trying to build the power of the faith community to address issues of systemic and structural injustice. And uh, he is uh, very much in many pulpits across the state on a week to week basis, preaching this gospel of belonging and justice and activation. Uh, I wanna appreciate all of you that were present with us this weekend or prayed with us as we went to Sacramento on Thursday to stand with the family and the community, uh, Stefan Clark, uh, and uh, got an opportunity to really amplify some work that we know needs to be done. We're gonna be heading back up there in about six to eight weeks uh, to, to, to bring another act of God, if you will, to the Cac Sacramento Capitol and remind them that God's people are firmly on the side of justice, particularly as it relates to the ongoing killing of our brothers and sisters and relatives and loved ones. And so we're so glad and thankful for his leadership. Uh, so come on and stand to your feet with me, everyone, and we'll welcome back to the pulpit, Pastor Ben McBride. And while you're on your feet and clapping, let's put our hands together for Jesus, who is the one that's really worthy of the praise. Come on, let's give him some real praise. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. Go ahead. You can take your seats in the presence of the Lord. It's good to be back here at the way. I feel like I haven't been here in months, but um, it's good to be to be back here and see so familiar, so many familiar faces. Uh, it, was, it was a pleasure this uh, morning. I, I ran into my my childhood buddy James Hill, who who's here, Sister Daisy's son, and our our friend, childhood friend. We grew up here uh, in this church. It was funny. I was just in a conversation. Uh, last week, and someone was asking me, uh, when's the first time outside of your family that you experienced belonging? And the story I actually told was, on our way to this church when we were kids, my father used to drive this church van. And, and Sister Renee knows, and Sister Daisy is, is somewhere around here. We had a nine-person church van, and we fit like 33 people in there. I don't know. <laughs> so I don't know if you can belong any, any deeper than that, right? You know, um, and thankfully, you know, my size always benefited me because that meant I at least got a seat. I think we had kids on, on the roof and hanging out of windows. So it's, it's good to, to be in the room and to belong and to be together and to still be rocking even at this moment. Um, so it's good to be in the house. I'm going to um, just go ahead and jump into the word. If you would just bow your heads with me and pray. Lord, we just want to say thank you for your goodness for your mercy. Lord, thank you that your power continues to be demonstrated to us that there is nothing too hard for God. That you are, not only are you working in the spaces that we can see, but you're working behind the scenes and surprising us with deliverance and surprising us with restoration and your power is always working. So Lord, as we gather for these moments, Lord, take my agenda, Lord, my own flawed understanding, paradigms, Lord, put that to the side. We ask that the power of your Holy Spirit would speak to us in these moments that, Lord, we would hear what it is your Spirit is saying to us. Call us forward into the way in which uh, you would want us uh, to be positioned, and we'll give your name all the praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name, everyone say amen. Hey man, just one, one more quick little plug. I really want to invite folks uh, after, uh, just to underscore what Pastor Mike said, um, encouraging people to get signed up for the Belong Symposium if you want to come. It's going to be at the Oakland Hilton. It's going to be a lot of food, a lot of training, a lot of good people, some disruption. Disruption is always good because we need some disruption in order to move from who we are to who it is that we need to be. 
And so we really want to encourage folks, um, for whatever points you can get there, try to get there, and let's see if the Spirit will speak uh, to us. I'm going to be talking to us uh, this morning about this word, belong. Everybody say belong. Now here's one thing that's interesting to me as I've been talking with folks about the notion of belong. This word oftentimes agitates a lot of people. I was sitting in the space with, with some folks, um, with some of my, my lovely black folks, and I was like, let's talk about this notion of belong. And, 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 and the folks in the group that I was with, they got all tense. They was like, what you talking about belong? You know what I'm saying? What you talking about with this? Right? They was like, what you, what you talking about belong? And they was like, what you, what you trying to say? We, we need to belong to some, some racist white people. What you trying to say? I said, all I said was the word belong. <laughs> so I didn't say nothing else. So we wanna, I want to walk a journey with us because I believe um, that the Spirit, what the Spirit's been speaking to me is that God is calling us to join God in creating a world where everyone belongs, where everyone thrives, where everyone can have agency over their lives. And so we're going to be walking a journey today about this notion of belonging and seeing how the Spirit is speaking to us. Go with me in the Bible to Exodus chapter 3. If you want to look up on it on the screen, you can check it out. Uh, beginning at verse 1, and Scripture reads, Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed. Somebody say, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard, somebody say, I have heard. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know. Someone say, I know. I know their sufferings, and I have come down. Somebody say, I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up. Somebody say, bring them up. And bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, the Berkeleyites, Oaklandites, and the Friscoites. <laughs> Amen. Am I in the book? Right? Y'all don't have that in y'all translation? It's... I'm selling them out in the parking lot, out the trunk of my car for three ninety nine. Right? Come. It's my side hustle, right? The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. You know, when we think about this notion of belong and belonging, it's challenged because we're living in a time right now where seeing the other and being seen, particularly across a difference, is becoming uh, a, a lost practice at times in our society. Um, the, the air is very toxic. Uh, a lot of that, I think, having to do with, with the toxicity coming out of Washington, D.C., Y'all remember when the air was bad, when the Paradise Fire was happening uh, down here, and even though, you know, somebody lied and told us if you paid $5 at CVS and put that little mask on your face, you weren't going to be breathing in that toxicity. You know, we all knew we was choking to death, but you just put it on anyway because it made you feel better, right? You know, that's a whole other sermon right now, right? There's stuff we putting on just because it make us feel better, but it really ain't helping us. But that's a whole other sermon right now. But in any case, we put on that mask. And we were all walking around here looking like, you know, Night of the Living Dead and World War Z, right? We walking around with the mask on. But there was no way really to escape the toxicity. And the challenge of the moment that we're in right now is toxicity is such in the air that it is putting a lot of pressure on a lot of us to move into our tribal corners. 
What do I mean by that? We're moved into these places where we, because of the toxicity, we're much more looking for who are the people that talk like me, sound like me, get down like me, rock with me, dress like me, live where I live, hang where I hang, and I'm going to go hang with those people so I feel safe. And then anybody who's not like me, I'm othering those people, and I'm like, y'all the devil, y'all crazy, and, and, and we need to just get rid of all y'all so people like me can be able to live free. Not y'all, y'all very spiritual people here at the way, you know, y'all were born in baptismal water and stuff. You drink anointing oil for breakfast and, and all of that good stuff. But for cats like myself who's struggling a bit, you know, it's hard sometimes to keep myself out of that tribal space, particularly when we've experienced trauma. Because when we've experienced trauma, you actually have a justified reason to, uh, or you feel justified, let me say it like that, to other. Right, you come in rooms and you just like, if you're anything like me, I kind of come into rooms sometimes with my preemptive strike ready. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You come in that room like, who is the person that's gonna get it today? Right, somebody, somebody want it, and I'm gonna be ready to give it to them before they give it to me, right? So you, you come and you spinning your little revolver on your little belt and you just ready for as soon as you say that answer, as soon as you say that racist, homophobic, I'm ready, pow, I'm about to shoot you down before, Right? Not y'all. Again, I'm from Oakland. I know this Berkeley, you know, so, you know. <laughs> y'all hugging trees out here and all that good stuff, right? <laughs> Did I just say I'm from Oakland? Oh, Lord, I'm from Frisco. James, you got to help me. That's, it's, I told y'all that time, it's in my blood now. I came. Well, in any case, we are struggling. We're trying to figure out. I can't believe I own tape. I said that. Lord, help me. Violence is in the land. Let me get back to the Bible because I'm in trouble. Violence is in the land. And we're living with the threat of injustice all around. And many times we're finding ourselves like the Israelites did in the, in the scriptures. They had been cast out of the city where they were, where they had their identity, their shared practices, their, their experiences. They had been cast out of Jerusalem and they were being led away in shackles to Babylon. And their tormentor said, sing us one of those old songs y'all used to sing in Zion. And they said, how can we sing the song of the Lord when we're in a strange land? Anybody feel like you're in a strange land? Like you're in a strange situation? Could be personally, could be in your family, could be in society, could be across the larger collective. What do you do? How do we live into the values that we know the Spirit is calling us to live into when we are in a strange situation? And we got muscle memory about how to react when we've been traumatized. What do you do? When you've done the will of God and it feels like God still hasn't shown up what, with what was supposed to happen after you did the will of God. It's in that place that the enemy still comes to test us. But the reason I love the scriptures is because the story of the Hebrews are not just true because they happened. They're true because they happen. Isn't it not true that we continue to find ourselves in gardens of Eden where we're having to make a choice between going with the tree of knowledge or going with the tree of life? Don't we continue to find ourselves in moments where we're trying to make an offering to God, which is the one we want, and God asks for a different offering, and our brother, sister, or relative is offering the offering to God that God asked for, and we get mad because our offering's not accepted the way someone else's is, so we use violence and destroy folks? Don't we still find ourselves in moments where God is telling us that bad stuff is about to happen and to build an ark, build something that could save people in moments, and we're realizing that a lot of folks really don't want to hear that truth? So the scriptures are true because, not just because they happened, but because they happen. You look at the story of the Hebrews, they found themselves in these cycles of what I like to call Exodus, empire, and exile. They were oppressed people, like many of us have a shared experience in our own stories. They were oppressed people, and they cried out to God here in Exodus chapter 3 for an exodus, for deliverance. And God hears their cry and sends down a deliverance because you do know God is always on the side of the oppressed. Do y'all know that? Right? You know, you jump over to Christian scripture. Paul says, to the Jew, I become Jew. To the Greek, I become Greek. To the weak, I become weak. God, you know, Paul, uh, Paul never says, to the strong, I become strong. See, God's never on the side of empire. God's always on the side of the oppressed. God's always on the side of those who are suffering. And so as they cry out to God, God gives them an exodus. But once they get in exodus and they get out of Egypt, you know, they start feeling themselves a little bit. And then they look at everybody else that's around them. Look at the money they have, the status they have, the identity they have, the power that they believe that they had. And they want to become an empire. 
Y'all know that's true. That's how we can get from time to time, right? When you were struggling, it was like, oh, Lord, if you come and save me and help me right now, I promise, I promise, I double promise, I triple promise, if you save me, it'll never happen again. And then as soon as you get that other job, you're like, I ain't got no time for God. I'll send God a check, amen, but I ain't got no time for God. They become an empire, and once you become an empire, it's not that God leaves you, it's that you leave God. They take on imperial strength, and then when they do so, they leave God, and God has to allow them to go into exile. Because adopting the way of empire will always take you ultimately into exile. It takes them into pain. It takes them into struggle. It takes them into having their world overrun until they finally have to rediscover their cry, or they can cry back out to God for an exodus. Now, it's clear for us in this country that we are not living in the promised land. We are much more living in Egypt or Rome. So one must ask, what is our faithful response as people who are following Jesus in the middle of this struggle? Now, we got to remember that Jesus shows up in the middle of this story of Exodus, empire, and exile. And Jesus comes to say, I'm coming to bring about a whole new world and turn the system upside down. Jesus says, I'm coming to enable you to both transform imperial systems without becoming imperial. To bring down the monster without becoming monstrous. So Jesus invites people to become new human beings fueled by Holy Spirit over human instinct who can join him in the world that he is making. See, as Jesus is calling us to make the world anew, he's calling us not just to change things that are happening into the world, but to do so in a way that is regulated by the Holy Spirit. You, know, you ever had something that's, that, that, that regulates something? You see, like the, the Holy Spirit is supposed to exist in our life, not just for us to change things that are happening on the outside, but to ensure that the way we go about changing them is informed by the way in which God is calling us to live in this world. Because what good does it do anyone if on our sojourn to the promised land, we become Pharaoh ourselves? Let's put that in your pipe and smoke it, right? There's a couple pipes in here, amen. I, I, I smell you uh, coming inside, right? Just, that, that, that what good does it do for us to get all over in the promised land and singing songs that we have now gotten free from Pharaoh and look in the mirror and we are the new one? You know, the power of the empire is it turns oppressed people into oppressors because it teaches us how to oppress. Oftentimes, what victims can learn, if not careful, is how to victimize. So we must ensure that we are recognizing it's not just about us getting power, but it's about who is God calling us to become so that we can really create a world where everybody belongs versus just creating another world where more people still are excluded. I was at an at a, at a activist organizing meeting, and, and, and there was a brother telling me, he said, well, I don't believe everybody belongs. I said, okay. I was like, well, let's, we, you know, we only got three minutes before we got to start the meeting, so let's just carry it all the way to the end of the conversation. What do we do with them? Do we kill them? Do we cage them? What do we do with them? And, and, and I said, I know that the people that don't like us, so what, what do we do with them? And I said, and if we do that, how are we any better than what we've seen been done to our people over the last 300 years? So I totally get it, this notion that you are frustrated, I am too, but the question is, who is the spirit calling us to become so we merely do not transform ourselves into the image of the beast? We, do we believe that God's got a better way and a deeper way for us to be human and a deeper way for us to be connected and a deeper way for us to be spiritual that has yet to be fully discovered? And maybe the Holy Spirit coming in our life is to do more than dance and shout. Oh, I wish I had a witness in the room. Maybe the Holy Spirit has come in our life to do more than just get you a blessing. Amen. But maybe the Spirit is coming in your life to transform you into a different version of yourself. Because you actually think that who you are right now is you. Could it be that you've never met yourself yet? 
You've been walking around like a caricature of somebody else's imagination when God is really trying to create who God thought about when he had you in his mind before your mother or father ever met you, met each other, and he had you in his mind. He said, before I formed you in your mother's belly, I knew you. I sanctified you. I ordained you to be a prophetic voice to the nation. So God has us on a journey because for the world to become a place of belonging, God needs to get us into a place of becoming. In this story with Moses, I'm not going to go too deep in it, but Moses is a fugitive from justice. He's only alive because some women saved him from infanticide. Some of his brothers better be thankful some women have saved us. Maybe not from infanticide, but for some other stuff. Amen. And, and Moses finds himself after killing uh, one of the Egyptians because he, he got all turned up and rightfully so about them oppressing his people. But he kills one of them and he's on the run and he tries to recreate himself. Y'all know how we do. He got rid of his old Facebook, created a new Facebook, right? <laughs> papyrus book. Man, it was papyrus book, right? He creates a new one. He's got his new job. He's a shepherd out in Midian doing his nine to five. You know, he's not engaged with the, with the oppressor anymore. He's doing his job. The scripture says he sees a bush on fire. And God, he, he looks, he sees the bushes on fire, but it's not being consumed. So he looks at the bush, and the scripture says that when he turns aside, God speaks to him from the bush. See, the first thing I want us to hold is that for God to bring us into the space of who God is calling us to become, we got to turn aside. Turn aside from the version of yourself that you so sold on. You just, you so, I'm, let me be nice, because I don't know everybody in here, right? Me, I've been so sold on versions of myself at times that, that nobody could convince me that who I was in that moment was not perfect. But God is trying to get us to turn aside, watch this, not from bad things, from good things. You, it's not that your life is broken or dysfunctional or wrong, I'm not bringing judgment to it, but could it be that God's trying to disrupt the pattern in your life? to bring about a new reality for you and ultimately a new reality for us. But God needs to disrupt your pattern and get you to turn aside. Somebody say disrupt the pattern. You know, uh, Dr. Cindy Suarez, Afro-Latina, wrote this book called The Power Manual. If any of y'all like, like to read around some of these, these notes of the books, it's a fascinating book. But she talks about the difference between a choice and a decision. And what she says is that decisions are made from a part of our brain that comes out of our instinct that we're making very rapidly all the time. We don't think about it. Our bodies don't, don't exude a lot of glucose in order to make that decision. We're, it, they're muscle memory. We just learn how to behave in a certain kind of way. But what she makes a distinction is that when we make what she calls a choice, she said our body, it takes more energy. It takes more glucose in order for us to make a choice than it does to make a decision. And one of the things that she's offering us is to recognize that if we're going to step into liberatory power, we've got to get out of the rhythm of decisions and step into the reality of choices. And maybe God is calling us to make a choice instead of decisions about the way that we've been living our life so that God can renew us and restore us and ultimately change this world. Are y'all feeling what I'm saying? God wants to cause us to turn aside. That means that we've also got to become some different version of ourselves. Somebody say becoming. We've got to be becoming different versions of ourselves. I was with Pastor Mike. We were at the beginning of the year with some of the civil rights legends down at the Sunnylands Ranch. I didn't know such a place existed, amen. It was a weird place to have a, a movement meeting because there was a bunch of 1980s white conservatives all on the wall. I kept feeling like I was in a haunted house. You know, I just was looking around, waiting for, y'all remember, uh, and get out, right? I just was waiting for, <laughs> somebody's gonna get me, right, you know? You know, as a black dude, when people drive me too far away from the main road, you know what I'm saying, I start having, you know. There's, there's two things I don't do. Don't drive me from the main road. I don't walk in woods. And I don't ski, praise the Lord, right? Huh? Something about tying pieces of wood to my foot and going down a steep snowy hill just... I got enough trauma. I don't need that kind of fear in my life. 
In any case, we were in this meeting with the civil rights legends, with Andrew Young and Bob and Janet Moses and, 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 and Joan Baez and, and Miss Minnie Jean Brown uh, Carter, I believe, one of the, is one of the 89-year-old 80, uh, sister or, or maybe mid-80s uh, sister who was a part of the Little Rock Nine. And so they told us we could ask some questions. So, you know, I'm going to ask my little fancy movement question. Y'all know how, well, me. Let me stay in I statements. I don't want nobody to get upset. Write me a letter. Amen. So I, I, I start getting in my, in my little self. So I said, okay, you know, did integration work was one of my questions. I said, because black folks lost all their institutions, house was so on and so forth, wanted to get over and integrate and be in space with other places. So did integration work? And if, if, if so, or if not, if you could do integration again, how would you do it differently? First question. Like, second question. She never answered that question. Second question I asked, I said, I know y'all use nonviolence as a tactic to bring about social change. I was like, but now we're living in a culture of violence where people are watching violence, people be killed on their phones on a daily basis. Do you still believe that nonviolence can, can actually move, you know, as it did then, the white moderate, the white extremists over uh, into your cause and over into our cause? And she started waving her hands like I had said a bad word. And I was like, man, what did I, what did I say? I got with her the next day. We, we had some conversation there, but I got with her the, the next day and I was hearing from her and, and I was asking it again and she said, so you said nonviolence as a tactic. I said, yeah. She said, you don't understand our movement. I said, she said, I grew up in Arkansas. I, I grew up walking as a little girl seeing black men swing from trees. I saw hatred. She said, nonviolence was not a tactic. Nonviolence was how I saved myself. I refused to become hate. So when you saw us show up in the street, yes, tactically, we use nonviolence, but we had chosen to become peace, to become the thing that we wanted to see in the world. And I think the Spirit's invitation for us is that we can simply long for ideas that we like in an ideological way, but the Spirit is causing us to become the very things that God wants to exist in the world. We've got to become peace and become love and become justice and become faith and become hope. Are y'all hearing that? That God says it's not enough for you to treat God like God is Walgreens and check in and make a transaction and buy your product and get up out the door. God says, no, 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 no. No, I am calling you to be transformed. In Jesus' day, the conservatives of his day, the Pharisees, found themselves feeling all froggy and like they had it all together. And they come up to Jesus, bring a woman who had been caught in adultery, and throw at her feet to be stoned. You know, they didn't bring no man, right? So we know she won't end it by herself. And if you know anything about Hebrew patriarchal culture, you know she was most likely the victim of an assault than she was caught up in adultery. Amen. Right? So here she finds herself in the middle of, of this story and, and in this vulnerable position. And Jesus tells the conservatives of his day, you who are without sin cast the first stone. Y'all here talking about the rule of law. Right? Cast the first stone if you yourself have not found yourself in any kind of mistake or situation. Then he tells the women, where are your accusers? Neither do I accuse you. Go, sin no more. He sets her free. And, and Jesus in that moment shows and reveals and challenges the bigotry and the hatred of the conservatives. But then Jesus also had to challenge the progressives. Because Jesus had his disciples who were rolling with him. You know, they were the woke people of his day. Right? You know, disciples, they roll around with Jesus, you know, man, we coming to turn the world upside down. I could already see it. I know Jesus was from the hood, so I know the disciples had to have swag, too. <laughs> it was from the hood. I, any place I go, you know, when you go to the hood, the hood just always got a little bit more swag. It's just a little bit more turnt, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. So, you know, the disciples was carrying on a little swag, and they come into the Samaritan village, the place that they had been othering. And they come in, it's like, hey, we're coming in to bring this Jesus revolution. We got this woke thing. You know, they so woke. Y'all know how woke we are. We the wokest of the wokest now. You so woke, your clothes stand up without you even being in them. You so woke, right? You so woke, your dreams are awake. You so woke, right? You just woke. Woke t-shirts, woke coffee. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> woke food. I'm just, just woke, right? You got all the new words, right? All the frameworks. You know all the conferences. 
You got that call out cape. You know, as soon as somebody you. I'm really talking about myself. Y'all pray for me, right? They woke as woke can be. And they tell Samaritans, we want, you got to get with this Jesus movement. The Samaritans say, we don't want none of that. You know what they say? So Jesus, can we call down fire from heaven and kill these people? You see, they have been walking with Jesus and yet still were showing up like the Romans. Proximity to Jesus without transformation does not lead to the world God's trying to make. So some of us think we can just get close to Jesus. Well, I come to church or I'm paying my tithes or I listen to gospel music on Sunday on KBLX or whatever get down you got. Proximity to Jesus without submitting to transformation changes nothing in us and nothing in the world. And Jesus is not calling for a progressive revolution. He's certainly not calling for a conservative revolution. Jesus is calling for the kingdom or the kingdom of God to create the world where everyone can belong, where there's space for all of God's children to belong. Even the ones you don't like. John 3, 16, for God so loved the... God so loved the... Don't say God loved the people you like. Don't say for God so loved the people that's in your political persuasion. God loved the world. So if you're going to follow God, you got to love what God loves. Ooh. I felt that one. You got to love what God loves and love who God loves. Jesus is calling us to be transformed, to become deeper versions of who God is calling us to be. The thing that scares me is when I look at the white, uh, uh, red hat wearing evangelicals. They showing up with a with a lot of toxicity. At times, I, I like to say that I think some of them are demon possessed. I I, I be like I think they possessed by the white supremacy. I, I I don't know at what moment that they abandoned the the gospel of Jesus and started worshiping at the altar of white supremacy. It, it, whether they were ever following the gospel of Jesus at all, I don't know. But you know what concerns me is that they don't know it. They feel sincere. And where they are. And what scares me is in 20 years, if I am trying to go about building a world of belongingness that does not include everyone, could I end up being the blue hat wearing believer who is showing up with imperial violence, othering and hatred and not know it? And have then taken myself to empire which means God's going to have to give me an exile. So the question is, as we move to trying to work on the world that we want, we must ask ourselves, who is God calling us to be so that we are not worshiping at the altar of self-serving intellectual humanism that leaves no room for the sacred or mystery of the divine? We must make sure we are not worshiping a false gospel that understands ourselves at the center of the universe, rooted in a heightened sense of ego and glorified celebration of self. A false gospel well, that places a Black Lives Matter sign in the window while not allowing your white kids to go to the school with my kids. A false gospel that learns how to post the right quotes about what's going on in the world while not giving up the systemic power that is challenging and hurting folks. We must make sure we're not bowing to a false gospel that feeds on call-out culture for the purpose of making others feel small so you can feel large, but rather one that's rooted in redemption and change. That Jesus is calling us to not get down with the counterfeit gospel that's accessible and easy. Cornel West says, for too long, American Christians have stood at the foot of Jesus' cross and caught his blood in a cup, turned it into Kool-Aid for mass distri distribution. Now that's a quote for you. <laughs> so we must make sure that we are not, as the scripture says in 2 Timothy 3.5, that we don't have a form of godliness.
that denies the power to make us godly. But the power of the spirit, if the spirit ain't checking you, listen, if the spirit is always agreeing with everything you want to do, that's not the spirit. If, if God is co-signing every thought you got, you and God. You know, I, I used to hate when I, when I was vocationally pastoring and I would counsel people sometimes. I don't know why people would come to sit and talk to me for an hour to tell me what them and God have been talking about. And you're asking me, you know, like, oh, I got this problem so and so. I'm like, well, maybe you should look at stepping out this way. Oh, no, you know, me and God, you know, me and God, me and God got this conversation. I'm like, well, if you and God got it worked out, you know, let me go to Starbucks then. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and you and God can sit right here and have this conversation by yourself. Right? If God is always agreeing with you, that's not God. God should be disrupting us and agitating us and calling us forward and calling for a deeper love. We should need to come in here to get full of the presence of the Lord so that we can respond to things that are happening in the world in a different way. I don't want to just be responding the way I've always responded. I want to be responding in a way that's fueled and activated by the Spirit of God. Are y'all hearing that? So if we're turning aside and becoming God wants to create a space where everyone is belonging, which means that we've got to recognize God's not going to pull us out of some of this drama. John 17, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but Jesus says in John chapter 17, he prays for the disciples. He says, listen, I'm praying for you because he's praying to God, I've given them your word, your word, the world has hated them. Because they do not belong to this world. As it is, we don't belong to this world as it is. But here's what he says, verse 15. I am not asking you to take them out of this world. Listen to Jesus. He's a, he, Jesus is a beast, y'all. Jesus is not trying to get us out of the world. Some of us think Jesus is about an eject button. You know, somehow you get a force field. and You just get to walk through the world and not have no problems. I don't know how we think we follow a dude that died on the cross and we ain't going to have no problems. You know what I'm saying? Like, if, you, if you're trying to follow an easy thing, you need to go find somebody that had an easy life. Like, dude didn't have an easy life. You know what I'm saying? Died on the cross. So if we're going to follow that Jesus, and he told folks, anybody that wants to come after me, you know what he said? First thing you got to do, Mark chapter 8, deny yourself. Everybody say, deny myself. He says, take up your cross. And follow me, not just worship me. Man, y'all y'all hear me? Follow me. Watch this. For whoever is seeking to save their own life will lose it. If you're trying to save your life, Jesus says you're going to lose it. If you're trying to avoid Egypt to hang out in Midian like Moses, you're going to lose it. You trying to just do your nine to five and have God bless your job promotions, you're going to lose it. But if you'll lose your life, lose your life for just Jesus. I'm just quoting the book. Lose your life for me and the sake of my message. He says you will find your life. Sitting here in front of incredible people. I'm looking across, there's so many of y'all that are doing incredible stuff. How is God calling us to turn aside? To become the deeper versions of ourselves so that we create a world where everyone can belong. As I close, Moses was on his mission. He was trying to live his life in Midian and God was calling him away, but God tells him after he convinces Moses that Moses needs to turn aside, become a new version of himself, and go back to Egypt. He tells him the sign that I have done what it is that I have done was not that y'all free, just free of Egypt, but it was that the sign would be that you all will worship God on this mountain. Church, what God is calling us to do is to create a world of worshiping people who are turning away from the pain and the injustice and the toxicity and the violence of our world, and they're turning to God to honor, to serve, 
to worship. And here's the thing. This is not about us going out and trying to evangelize everybody and trying to push your religious orientation on everybody. As somebody that started off, I used to be a, a, a hot blood evangelist. I'd be walking around. I was that dude you would avoid 20 years ago. All right, I'd walk around. I wanted to tell you you was full of sin, right? I did. This is really, it's really a sad thing, right? But one of the things that, <laughs> man, I, yeah, I just thought of that, that little young fella. God bless him, right? I'm so glad people didn't throw him out, you know. But the one thing I would say, <laughs> the one thing that I would say and invite us to hold is that God is calling us to be the worshiping people who live as these new expressions in the world and recognizing that God will bring the world to a worshiping people, not by our force, not by us behaving like empire, but by us behaving as Jesus did. Jesus gave up his life and the world followed him. So how is God calling us to give up our lives so that the world can follow Jesus and get to a space of belonging? Turn aside. Become who God is calling you to be. And let's see God bring us into a deeper sense of belonging and help us serve God in creating a deeper sense of belonging. Stand on your feet with me. You might feel today, you might feel today like, yo, Ben, I'm, I'm struggling knowing my own life and just this notion of turning aside, becoming a new version of myself. I'm just trying to figure out how to get oxygen. Feel like I'm drowning in struggle and pain and challenge. I don't know that we ever get to a place where, like, we, we won't be struggling, where we can just work on ourselves and not, not be a part of what God's doing. I, I'm 40, I'll be 42 this month, and I still ain't seen that moment. So I think a part of this is always living in the, is it dialectic? Come on, y'all college people, y'all got more degrees than thermometers, y'all help me, right? You know, living in that, in that, in that energy of becoming, God using me to help bring belonging. I'm becoming, God's helping me to create belonging. I don't have it all right, but I'm turning aside and I'm saying, Lord, here I am. Here's the thing I love about this scripture. It says that God knew their suffering. God saw, God was coming down. So I want to say to somebody that while you're in the middle of struggle, God sees God knows God's coming down and God's going to bring you up. So since you know God's going to do that, how might you be able to say, so Lord, here I am. I surrender to you. I make myself available because I know you're already working on my behalf. Lift your hands, everyone. If you will, if you're okay with that. Moses, as he was on that journey, I was asking one of the Jewish Rabbis, I said, am I getting this passage right? He said, yes, you're getting it right, Ben. One thing you're forgetting, or you don't know that we say in Judaism. He said, for us, we believe the bush was always on fire, but God was waiting for someone to see it. Could it be that the bushes on fire all around us are actually God's invitation to transform us and the world we live in? Moses came to the bush and said, I am not able. I got too much baggage, too much drama. I'm not perfect. God said, I am will be with you. So lift your hands, Lord. We pray right now the power, the spirit of I am. You are everything that we need. You are everything that we need to become. You have the power to break all of the challenges that we find that rest inside our bodies, that rest inside our spirits. You're coming to redeem not just our spirit, but also to redeem our bodies, to help us redeem the value of our bodies and our minds and our place in this world that we belong. And so God, we pray right now that your Holy Spirit comes and ministers to us in the way in which we feel oppressed, 
the way in which we feel empty, the way in which we feel not ready to step into what we know you are calling us into. And Lord, we might not even know what you're calling us into, but we feel the invitation of your spirit. God, would your spirit come and push us, push us, Lord, to not staying where we've been, but to step in to who you're calling us to become.